Our last speaker of the day is Dr. Zakir Naik. Dr. Zakir is renowned as a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. He also clarifies Islamic viewpoints and clears misconceptions about Islam using the Quran, authentic hadith, and other religious scriptures on a basis in conjunction with reason, logic, and scientific fact. He is popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by audiences after his public talks. He has also authored several books on Islam and comparative religion. Now I present to you Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي My respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته May the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, be upon all of you. The topic of my talk is concept of God in major religions. Religion, according to the Oxford Dictionary, means a belief in a superhuman controlling power, a personal God or gods that deserve worship and obedience. In short, religion means belief in God. To understand the concept of God in any religion, we should not observe what the followers of that religion do. To understand the concept of God in any religion, we have to try and understand what the scriptures have to speak about Almighty God. And if we analyze the scriptures of the major world religions, they emphasize on oneness of God, on unity of God, on Tawheed. First, we'll discuss the concept of God in Hinduism. If you ask a common Hindu that how many gods does he believe in? Some may say three, some may say thousand, some may say 33 crore, 330 million. But if you ask a learned Hindu who's well versed in the scriptures, he will tell you that the Hindus should believe and worship in only one God. But the common Hindu, he believes in a philosophy of pantheism. The common Hindu says, everything is God. The tree is God, the sun is God, the moon is God, the human being is God, the snake is God. What we Muslims say, everything is God's. G-O-D with an apostrophe S. Everything belongs to God. The tree belongs to God, the sun belongs to God, the moon belongs to God, the human being belongs to God, the snake belongs to God. So the major difference between the Hindus and the Muslims is the common Hindu says, everything is God. What we Muslims say, everything is God's. G-O-D with an apostrophe S. If we can solve the difference of apostrophe S, the Hindus and the Muslims will be united. How do we do it? As Allah says, Ta'ala ila kalimatin sawa im bainana bainakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah that he worship none but one almighty God. Let's analyze what the Hindu scriptures have to speak about almighty God. Among the sacred scriptures of the Hindus is the Chandogya Upanishad, which mentioned in chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. Ikkam evidityam. It's a Sanskrit quotation which means, God is only one without a second. It is mentioned in the Shrita Sutara Upanishad, chapter number 6. Verse number 9. Which in Sanskrit means of him, that is Almighty God. He has got no Lord. He has got no parents. He has got no superior. He has got no mother. He has got no father. Among the Hindu scriptures, the most sacred are the Vedas. It's mentioned in Yajurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3. Na atasya pratima asti. Of him, there is no pratima. Pratima means images, 
photographs, statues, sculptures, paintings. Almighty God, he has got no images, no photographs, no statues, no sculptures and no paintings. It is mentioned in Yajurved, chapter number 40, verse number 9. Adhat prapavishanti ya asambuti mupaste. They are entering into darkness, those who worship the asambuti, that is the natural things like fire, water, air, etc. The verse continues, they are entering more in darkness, those who worship the sambuti, that is the created things like table, chair, idols, etc. Who says that? Yajurved chapter number 40, verse number 9. And the Brahma Sutra, the fundamental creed of Hinduism is Ekkam Brahma Dutya Naste Nana Naste Kinchan Bhagwan Eki Hai Dusra Nahi Hai Nahi Hai Nahi Hai Zara Bhi Nahi Hai There is only one God, not a second one Not at all, not at all, not in the least bit So if you read the Hindu scriptures You shall understand the concept of God in Hinduism That you should worship only one God before we discuss the concept of God in Christianity, let me make a few points clear. Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith for its followers to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe that he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. The Muslims and the Christians are going together. But one may ask, so where are the parting ways? There are many Christians who say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. He said that he was almighty God. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says, I am God, or where he says, worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, it's mentioned in Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, my father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devils with the Spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20. I, with the finger of God, cast out devils. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says, I seek not my will, but the will of my Father, he's a Muslim. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was a Muslim. It's mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. Ye men of Israel, Listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God, by wonders, miracles and signs, which God did by him and you are witness to it. When Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was asked the first commandment, he repeated verbatim what was said by Moses, peace be upon him. In Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse 29. Shama Israelu adna ilahaine adna ikhat. Here, O Israel, our Lord, our God is one. So if you read the Christian scriptures, you shall understand the concept of God in Christianity, that you should worship only one God. Let's discuss the concept of God in Islam. The best reply that any Muslim can give you regarding the concept of God in Islam is quote to you Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Allahu samad. Allah the absolute, the eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. And there is nothing like him. This is a four-line definition. If anyone says that so-and-so candidate is God, and if that candidate fits in this four-line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as God. This Surah Ikhlas is the touchstone of theology. This concept of believing in one sole creator and sustainer of the whole of universe is the only uniting factor for the whole of mankind. It is the only solution for global unity and peace. I would like to end my talk with a quotation of Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 73. Ye men, there's a parable set forth for you. Listen to it. Those whom you call upon besides Allah, they cannot even create a fly. 
and even if they got together and if the flight took away something from them they cannot even release from it fi bila those who petition fi bila those on whom they petition wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin jazakallah brother zakir truly this conference has been very beneficial for many of us i would once again like to thank all my brothers on the day for their contribution tonight may allah reward all of you the credit for this program goes to two teachers of islamic international school sister maisa and sister sadi may allah reward them for their efforts amen Alhamdulillah wassalatu wassalam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbi ajma'in amma ba'd a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim qul in kana aba'ukum wa abna'ukum wa ikhwanukum wa azwajukum wa ashiratukum wa amwalun iqtaraftumuha wa tijaratun takhshawna kasadaha wa masakin tardawnaha ahabba ilaykum min allah wa rasulihi wa jihad fi sabilihi fatarabbasu hatta ya'ti allah bi amrihi wallahu la yahdi alqawm alfasiqin rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wahlul uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli my respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God be upon all of you. The topic of my talk is Dawa or destruction. I started my talk with a quotation from the glorious Quran from Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 and Surah Tawbah happens to be one of the most militant surah of the glorious Quran why is Surah Tawbah one of the most militant surah of the glorious Quran because it is the only surah it is the only chapter in the glorious Quran which does not begin with the formula Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name of Allah most gracious most merciful otherwise every surah every chapter of the glorious quran begins with the formula bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim in the name of allah most gracious most merciful but surah tawbah does not begin with the formula bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim the reason is because it is one of the most militant surah of the glorious quran for example If you are walking along with your sister or along with your mother along the streets of Mumbai and if there's a hooligan if there's a ruffian who snatches the handbag of your mother and runs away what will you do but naturally you'll run after him and after you catch him you will not say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may peace be on you you will not say bismillah ar rahman ar rahim you will get down to the subject directly You will say, "Hey, Mister, give the handbag, or else I'll break your neck." Hey, Mister, give the handbag, or else I'll break your leg. You will get down to the subject directly. Bismillah is not called for. And if you read the first few verses of Surah Tawbah, chapter number nine, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is talking about a peace treaty between the Mushriks of Makkah and the Muslims. And this peace treaty. it was unilaterally broken by the mushriks of makkah and by the time allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 5 he is giving the mushriks of makkah an ultimatum warning that put things straight in four months time otherwise a declaration of war and when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving an ultimatum a warning to the mushriks of makkah bismillah is not called for that's the reason some scholars say that surah tauba does not begin with the formula bismillah rahman rahim this is one of the reasons there are several other reasons and by the time allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 24 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is addressing us muslims now we muslims we are in the firing line allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says qul 
in kana abaukum see whether it be your fathers wa abnaukum your sons wa ikhwanukum your brothers wa azwajukum your spouses wa ashiratukum your relatives allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking what are your considerations are they your fathers are they your sons are they your brothers are they your spouses are they your relatives allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking what are your considerations and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues and says wa amwalun iqtaraftumuha wa tijaratun takhshawna kasadaha wa masakin tardawnaha the well that you have amassed the commerce in which you fear a decline the houses in which you live allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking what are your considerations are they your fathers are they your sons are they your brothers are they your spouses are they your relatives the well that you have amassed the commerce in which you fear a decline the houses in which you live allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking what are your considerations and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues and says ahabba ilaykum min allahi wa rasulihi wa jihad fi sabili if you love all these eight things more than allah his rasul and doing jihad in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's way then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says fatarabbasu then wait hatta ya'ti allah bi amri wallahu la yahdi al-qawm al-fasiqin then wait until allah brings his destruction unto you and allah guides not the fasiq people allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious quran in surah muhammad chapter number 47 verse number 38 wa in tatawallaw yas tabdil qawman ghayrakum thumma la yakunu amsalakum and if you do not do your job then allah will substitute in your place another people thumma la yakunu amsalakum and they will not be like you allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious quran in surah ali imran chapter number 3 verse number 110 kuntum khaira ummah ukhrijat lin nas you are the best of people evolve for mankind allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us an honor by calling us khaira ummah that's the best of people whenever there is an honor it is always followed up with responsibility there is no honor without responsibility for example a principal has got more honor than a teacher a teacher has got more honor than a clerk similarly a principal has got more responsibility than a teacher a teacher has got more responsibility than a clerk there is no honor without responsibility Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us an honor by calling us khaira ummah that is the best of people don't you think we have a responsibility and the reply is given in the same verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ta'muruna bil ma'ruf wa tanhawna 'anil munkar wa tu'minuna billah enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong and believing in Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us an honor because we should enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah if we do not enjoy what is right and do not forbid what is wrong then we are fit to be called as khaira ummah we are fit to be called as muslims it is the duty of every muslim to convey the message of islam to the non muslims to those who are unaware of it and many muslims they give the excuse for not doing the job they tell me that brother zakir You know one day when I'll have the knowledge then I'll start doing dawa. They think one day when they'll have the knowledge, one day when they'll become a big sheikh like Sheikh Ahmad Didat, they'll start doing dawa. That time will never come. Abul Awwad Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, it is mentioned Sahih Bukhari volume number 4, Book of Knowledge, hadith number 3461. Balligh anni walaw aya. Propagate even if you no know one was even if you know one verse of islam as long as you know it correctly it is your duty to propagate it to the non muslims to those who are unaware of it allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious quran in surah ghashiyah chapter number 88 verse number 21 fadhkir inna ma anta mudhakkir lasta alaihim bi musaytir your job is to convey giving hidayah it is in the hand of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We don't have to wait for results. We have to convey the message. Giving hidayah it is in the hands of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says in the glorious Quran in Surah Asr, 
chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3. Wal asr, inna al insana la fi khusr, illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihat, wa tuwasaw bil haq, wa tuwasaw bil sabr. By the token of time, man is verily in a state of loss. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Except for those who believe وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ And do righteous deeds وَتْوَاسَوْ بِالْحَقِّ Exhort people towards truth that is da'wah وَتْوَاسَوْ بِالْصَبْرِ And exhort people towards patience and perseverance. There are minimum four criteria for any human being to enter Jannah. Iman, righteous deeds, exhorting people towards truth that is da'wah and exhorting people towards patience and perseverance. If one of them is missing, under normal circumstances, you will not enter Jannah. You may be a very good Muslim. You may be offering Salah five times a day. You may be giving Zakat. You may be fasting in the month of Ramadan. But if you do not do Dawah, under normal circumstances, you will not enter Jannah. Not only Dawah is important, all four criteria are equally important. Iman, righteous deeds, Exhorting people towards truth, that is da'wah, and exhorting people towards patience and perseverance. If one of them is missing, under normal circumstances, you will not enter Jannah. If Allah wants to forgive you, it is upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 48, and Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 116, Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bih. Allah will not forgive the sin of shirk, but He will forgive anything else to whom He pleases. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 104. Well, takum minkum ummah, yadu'una ila al khair, wa ya'muruna bil ma'roof, wa yanahawna anil munkar, wa ulaika humul muflihun. Let there arise out of you a band of people inviting towards all that is good, enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong. And they are the ones to attain felicity. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about full-time da'is. And Surah Asr, chapter number 103, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about part-time da'is. And it is the duty of every Muslim to be a part-time da'i. And according to Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 104, it's talking about full-time da'is. How many full-time da'is do we have? Like how we have full-time doctors, full-time lawyers, full-time engineers. How many full-time da'is do we have? These Christian missionaries, there are hundreds of thousands traveling from one country to another, spreading their religion. How many full-time da'is do we have? How many? And according to Surah Asr, chapter number 103, it is the duty of every Muslim to be a part-time da'i. And those who are full-time da'is, they are the ones to attain felicity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Nahl, chapter number 16, verse number 125. <laughs> And invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preachings and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises us in the glorious Quran in no less than three different places. In Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 verse number 33. In Surah Saf chapter number 61 verse number 9. And in Surah Fatah chapter number 48 verse number 28. Huwa arsala rasulahu bil huda wa al haqq. It is Allah who has sent down His messenger with the religion of truth so that it will supersede over all the other religions, over all the other isms, whether it be Christianism, Judaism, secularism, Buddhism, atheism, anyism. Islam is destined to supersede them all, master them all, overcome them all. And how much ever the mushriks did not like it. And with a different ending, in Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28, وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَهِيدًا And enough is Allah as a witness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that His deen, this deen, it will prevail. With or without you, with or without me, the rubbish that we are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require you and me to make His deen prevail. 
If we think that if we do da'wah, then Islam will spread, then we are the biggest fool. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us an opportunity to make hay while the sun is shining. If we think that if we don't do da'wah, then Islam will not spread, then we are the biggest fool. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us an opportunity to do a prophet's job and earn a prophet's reward. I would like to end my talk with a quotation from the glorious Quran from Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33. Woman ahsanu qawlan mimman da'a ila Allah wa amila saliha wa qala innani minal muslimin. Who is better in speech than one who invites others to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, works righteousness and says that I am a Muslim. وَآخِرُوا دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ جزاك الله دكتور زاكر Message so final for you The time